Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, which this year would be Ordinary 15a, and falls on July 12th, are Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 13. The alternate first reading is Genesis 25, verses 19 through 34. Psalm 65, verses 9 through 13, or you can include verses 1 and read through 13. And Romans 8, verses 1 through 11. And the gospel reading is Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9, and then picking up again at 18 through 23. Because you wouldn't want to include the difficult part. Right. Oh, of course not. So let's skip those verses. No, so, you have to do those verses. What? You have to do those verses. Well, that I, I would suggest that you do. Yeah. Add oh, them back good. in. We yeah. fixed that. Yeah. So, but uh, before we get there, I think it's worth uh, the preacher to step back and say that moving into this chapter of Matthew, I think there's what, seven parables ahead? Uh, so I think that's right. Uh, seven parables ahead. So we move into this um, discourse in, uh, in Matthew, this, um, uh, this particular section with uh, these, you know, this typical way that we think of of Jesus speaking and Jesus teaching. Uh, but I think it's also um, every, every time it comes along, I think it's a challenge for preachers to figure out what, uh, what exactly is to do with uh, these parables. And uh, so might be, might be worth a little time for the preacher to just kind of uh, step back and think about what, what is a parable? What is it supposed to do? What is it not supposed to do? Uh, and uh, kind of get into that mindset, especially um, as we look toward the next few weeks. And as we're adding in, I would uh, um, point the context. Uh, it begins uh, on that same day, which is uh, the day that uh, Jesus is misunderstood by his mom and his siblings. And um, a part of explaining um, the simplicity of uh, parables is similar to one would expect that family would know you best. And uh, where that is evident, it is also true that parables are not as easy as they might appear on the surface. I always like the, like the definition of a parable too, which I think, um, you know, people, I, maybe, maybe people don't remember, but I mean, it literally means to throw alongside, right? You're, you're throwing two things alongside each other. And, and uh, I, I think that, I think there's something um, that's, important in thinking about that definition of uh, there's kind of, there's something sort of um, disruptive in this, or there's something that's, uh, wait, those, you know, one of these things is not like the other, right? Or there's something in that comparison that's supposed to sort of uh, maybe unnerve you or really call you into question so that the the immediate response to the parable is not to to solve it or to figure it out, but to sort of sit in that space of, of that parallelism and and what it what what happens when when uh, when these things are thrown alongside each other what uh, so I think that's it it also invites a kind of hermeneutic I think that uh, we don't often I don't know if we uh, as often engage in as preachers but here we have a parable of the sower or the soils Anybody want to weigh in? Well, I think it's a great passage for, you know, the setting. Like, like Joy said, we've just gotten a statement of Jesus being um, disconnected to his family, disconnected to those who should know him best. Perhaps they view him as irresponsible, as a firstborn son who has left home and perhaps left his mother and and siblings alone to fend for themselves. It's not clear uh, if he has a father at this point in his life. So there's, there's a lot of weird things that he's doing and this sense of not fitting in. And then you get parables that are about uh, who fits and who doesn't, at least this one next week's parable, or who belongs and who doesn't, or who's true and who's fake. 
And in the midst of it, you also get that central section that's so important, not just because of the disturbing passages where Jesus talks about uh, shielding the truth from some, but also because he says, this is verse 16, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. I mean, he's, he also in that, in the course of that, of that passage, also verse 11, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. So there are these clear statements to his people that they are insiders, that they have a, a privileged status in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their accessibility to him, and in terms of just their sheer chosenness, which is always a slightly offensive biblical theme, but there it is. So it's in the midst of some really unnerving parables, there's also these words of promise to his own people that are really important, I think, to look at because sides are starting to get drawn in this story, really uh, not just stark and disturbing sides, but sides that will eventually prove to be lethal in the story. Now, we might want to criticize that and talk about you know, binaries and, and dualisms and the problem with thinking that way in, in our ethical lives, but uh, it's what's going on in the story here. So it's important to set this in the stage of a ministry that is not really working the way you might have thought it was going to work. If you thought working meant Jesus loves everybody and everybody loves him back. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's an important point and, and noting, yes, you have that, that those blessings uh, and the reality yet that yes, the, the disciples or those in, in Jesus inner circle are able to see what others are not able to see, particularly uh, when you get in verses um, 11 to 13, the crowds, uh, the crowds then uh, do, not, uh, do not understand uh, what, what Jesus has to say. Uh, but I think it's a, it's, there's promise in that, but at the same time, uh, this is where you go back to the Beatitudes and where you have those where you have those blessings of hungering and thirsting for righteousness and then immediately after that and you are the light of the world you are the salt of the earth and so i think it's i think one thing one of the themes then in these parables is yeah you you'll be able to hear uh and see what other people are not able to hear and see about the kingdom and then also to give witness to that or to what is that then going to look like how are how are other people going to know what is what is going to be your testimony or what are going to be your actions then that uh, that maybe invite other people to see or so there's a it's a promise and there's also I think a responsibility um, in this that yes we're we, there is that promise of being um, of having that charge but at the same time there's there's something that we're then called to do as a response. And I like that, the importance of the responsibility that is um, uh, clearly uh, assigned. But in light of what Matt was saying, or I should say, and in light of what Matt was saying, it is not a call for power over or power against. It is an invitation, uh, as you said, Caroline, to be a witness, to be that testimony, to offer that hope. Uh, in, in the midst of uh, uh, a world that uh, is um, the other line that is at the beginning or in the previous text is that these were also people that were looking for a sign. And um, sometimes that sign does not come the way that we expect. And I think that's another piece that is evident here um, is that um, we're looking for something and we may not recognize it when it shows up. A lot of parable interpretation, and this, trust me, I'm building on what you're saying here, Joy. It's going to take me a second, but a lot of parable interpretation in the early mid 20th century was all over against allegorical interpretations, right? Don't impose allegorical structures on parables where every character has to correspond to one thing. It's a good rule, except when you're dealing with Matthew 13, and this parable he gives an allegorical interpretation to, and the next parable next week he'll give an allegorical interpretation to. So parables are not allegories except when they are, is the, the bottom line there. <laughs> one of the things I appreciate about this parable, though, is where Jesus does not allegorize one, one feature of that, and that's this notion of fruit bearing, because he tells you what the soils are, he tells you what the seed is, he tells you uh, the, the, what the devil is. He tells you what, what 
hot weather and you know, adverse circumstances are. So what does it mean to bear fruit and especially to yield 160 or 30 fold these pretty healthy yields. Earlier in the gospel, he talks about bearing fruit as a kind of moral and other places as well. You know, you'll know them by their fruit, a kind of what you produce. But I like that he doesn't explain necessarily what that means here. And so is fruit bearing my own rewards, my own glory, or is it that, that service that we're talking about, that being called to take the secret that you've been given, take the mystery you've been given, take the, um, I'll use the word privilege again, or this kind of insider access that you've uh, been blessed, not earned, but you've been blessed to receive and somehow multiply that. And that's, so the fact that that's not allegorized or not defined, I think opens up a lot of, inter a lot of imagination at that point in the parable, right? What, do you, what are we here for? What's the, what's the offspring or what's the consequence of our knowing? all of this stuff and, and how is it going to help the world or is it not? I hadn't thought about it like that. I like that, Matt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Well, thank you. <laughs> the, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure I stole it from somewhere and one day, 10 years from now, I'll read it and I'll go, oh yeah, it was their idea all along. Rolf. I'm struck by two things uh, or actually a bunch of different things. Uh, but one is it, it both in the passage that that comes right before uh, this one. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, not not at the end, right? With the in verse nine, let in let, uh, let, let the one who with the ears hear, and then in the part that skipped um, towards the end of that, um, the line Jesus says, "Blessed are your eyes for they see, and your ears for they hear," which is a little you know uh, a beatitude there, just a little one. Um, that kind of does recall the passage Caroline uh, was going on, and then and then there's just the emphasis in the explanation in the in the in the allegorizing of the parable of uh, about hearing, and um, so that's that's interesting to me, and it's interesting that this is the first of of all these parables that are going to come in some ways. Then this is a, a sign about understanding the rest of these parables. That are that Matthew puts all in one section. Um, I have always liked the fact that that the sower, which in some ways, as a preacher, uh, preachers should regard themselves in some ways as the sower, the planter, here, uh, you know, uh, spreading God's word um, wildly. Um, my brother-in-law, I think. I might have said this three years ago, whenever we had this parable, but my brother-in-law works for um, John Deere, uh, and they, he's an engineer, and he was really excited a few years ago that they had developed a new technology which cut down on the waste of seed. I won't go into it, uh, but it's, it was a way to stop the seed that was being planted by their cultivators uh, from uh, rolling as it was dropped, but it was just instead dropped down and um, this the point is this this planter is so wildly the opposite. Um, the, this sower throws seed on the path in the rocks. Um, he uh, he or she doesn't just try to plant it in the perfect soil. Um, it seems to me, at least in some ways, that um, that is uh, that that's encouragement to to uh, share God's word word wi widely. Well, and it seems that that's the connection, right, to the second or the the uh, reading from Isaiah. That that's the the connection that you're making, Rolf, is is what you know what the lectionary is making with regard to the Isaiah verse. And and you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your reflections, uh, Rolf, uh, that this is you know this is what a preacher does, right? That the, the preacher. Uh, throws God's word out there and and where it lands, where it lands. And I, the the immediate thing I thought about, that's the immediate thing I thought about with the Isaiah passage. And I'm sure we've, I know we've talked about this before. It ends up being, you know, a, an ordination verse frequently for, or ordination 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 passage for a lot of uh, a lot of newly ordained persons. But I I I want this year. Uh, particularly in the past, the events of the past months with the pandemic and uh, 
uh, the protests uh, with regard to um, uh, George Floyd's murder and, and how is it that we are going to uh, address systemic racism in our country and in the world, that, uh, that there might be a lot of preachers out there who just really wonder <laughs> what, where their word lands and how it lands. And, uh, and maybe they just not preach on this, but maybe just hear promise in it. Like it's a little mini sermon to them that this is uh, this this is what's this is what's promised in God's word, uh, and sometimes that word is rejected. And sometimes when we're saying difficult things, when we're saying truths that people don't want to hear, uh, sometimes that word is accepted. Sometimes it leads to uh, a great yield, uh, and uh, not a lot of that we get to see. Uh, but uh, I think that I. I just, I wanted preachers to hear that this year, uh, and that maybe this is a little sermon to them, the spirit speaking to them this year. That's a good word. Hmm. It's a good contrast to the parable, especially, which is about soils. There's mm -hmm. no, it's the same word that gets sown everywhere. The soils are what make the difference. Isaiah 55 implies that the sea, or I shouldn't say the sea, but the word itself has a particular power to accomplish whatever that's going to look like. Not that you have to choose one image over the other, not that you have to necessarily reconcile the images so that they fit neatly, but another way of talking uh, about this. So if the, if the parable disturbs you, <laughs> congregation, uh, uh, notice that the word also has its ways of growing in those uh, difficult spots and has things to do uh, as well and maybe helps people make sense of their own ways of of not getting stuff or coming around later or reminding people that sermon that I preached that really made you mad a couple of months ago um, maybe that stuck with you you know I mean not you can do that in a way that's totally arrogant as a preacher right and say yeah I'm always right you're always wrong but you can also just help people interpret why sometimes the sermon makes them angry or why sometimes the sermon makes them frustrated or why sometimes the sermon's too easy or, and to help them see that the word is at work in different ways in people's lives and minds. When I started, uh, when I looked at uh, the Isaiah text, my first thought after reading the Matthew text was, you know, here I am once again, um, getting a natural explanation that's falling on deaf, deaf ears of this urban dwelling act ivory tower academic um i near about flunked geology when i was in college and so all of this stuff kind of catches me except the imagery that is presented here um, suggests experiencing something one doesn't expect and that's whether you're scratching your head with the parable or you're seeing uh, the um, really, really good that could come out of uh, something that you didn't expect, which is, um, is the literal images that you have in Isaiah 55, where you know, um, 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 you'll go out in joy, but be led back in peace. Uh, the mountains and the hill before you shall burst in song. And, and, and it's like the beauty uh, becomes uh, even more powerful in its peace, in its uh, song, in its comfort. Um, and maybe I read too much of that portion of Isaiah as comforting, but uh, that, those were the images that began to resonate for me, literally, as I read those words this time. It is one of the, it, it, it is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. Uh, that section from Isaiah 55. And so um, we better move on before I start talking about it. Oh, wow. So I'll probably never shut up. I wished I had, had given you that spot. Oh, no. Uh, you, well, you said perfect. <laughs> what if you. That's all right. The Jacob story is my favorite part of Genesis. So the. Uh, just a word about the psalm before we go that, because the psalm picks up on that. Obviously, the reason the psalm is chosen as the response to the first reading from Isaiah is the end of it picks up that same language about um, creation responding. You know, that is the pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hills gird themselves with joy, the meadows clothe themselves with flocks. Um, it's, it's, um, that's more, it's actually more of a, um, more of a harvest um, 
psalm, so it's a little odd to have it here. But if uh, a, a lot of congregations in our context are, are worshiping outdoors right now instead of indoors uh, because of uh, the, the, pande the, the COVID um, virus itself uh, doesn't fare very well in the outdoor humidity and it doesn't spread as much. And so um, th it just might be a, a perfect psalm uh, to focus about you know, God's work in creation and to call forth, um, uh, to call forth uh, you know, a reflection on beauty, a reflection on God's abundance and fertility, um, something along those lines. But now you wanted to talk about Jacob, the, uh, the so-called Jacob cycle. Matt. Oh yeah, you know, long time listeners know I love Jacob. So he's the, uh, yeah, he's the centerpiece of Genesis for me. So. And what do you give love me, about Jacob. Jacob? I love that God loves him. And that he gets by uh, just partly out of just will, desire, this idea of wanting a blessing no matter what. And we'll do what it takes to get it uh, in these stories. So. Uh, I love that about him, the, the, the way that takes this, this trickster motif and puts it, uh, talks about it, you know, a trickster in the service of God or as one who refuses to be shut out of, of divine blessing or refuses to be shut out of, of, of God's order and, and we'll find a place for that. So it's, you know, it's this, of course, a story that has themes that stretch throughout scripture. So... I like him. I read this, um, and maybe in light of where we are today, um, I, I usually uh, am, am with you, Matt, and just loving uh, to um, get to know uh, the consistency of the identity of Jacob uh, from, you know, while he was yet in his mother's womb. But what struck out for me uh, this time as I read it was this idea of two nations are in your womb, peoples. And, and um, you know, just the reality that where we are um, as we preach this text now is um, how do we move away from just that individual to actually pay attention to the communities that we are a part of and to see God's love for all of those communities, not one over the other, but one for the other. And uh, that really stood out for me this time. Uh, as I read this this text, the um, Jacob is uh, is characterized in the way that you know the fundamental feature of Hebrew narrative is it it characterizes not by dis uh, it shows it doesn't tell, and so you you see a character uh, do something and and uh, or or not do something behave in a certain way and it tells you about it and then then it usually won't comment on it in the way that modern literature will so often do. Um, it's sparse in that way. And so you, what you're gonna get in these weeks is Jacob is a profoundly um, gray character, um, uh, morally, um, um, ethically, in terms of uh, how he treats other people, in terms of how he treats his daughter uh, in the passage that will never show up in any lectionary, probably, uh, The Rape of Dinah. Um, in the way that he um, treats his sons, um, how he, you know, uh, actually is mad at Dinah's uh, full brothers for avenging her, and he's worried about how it reflects on him and how he plays favorites with um, first um, his eleventh son and his twelfth son. Right? It's um, he's a profoundly gray character, and what what happens in this character is he takes advantage of. Uh, his his brother Esau. Uh, in this one, he steals the birthright, which the, the the commentary on the website does a good job of explaining what comes with a birthright. Um, but if, in essence, uh, the the firstborn um, is going to get the family business and gets um, an extra share of the of the will of the estate, rather. So in this case, it would be sixty six percent versus thirty three, and so uh, Jacob uh, flaps that on him for a bowl of lentil stew. And I don't even like lentils that much. Um, 
I heard a great sermon on this from one of our, P, uh, our demon preachers a few years ago who preached on it and said, would I do that? Would I, would I, would I for a bowl of stew, would I trade my birthright? Of course not. He goes, but I trade my health for a plate of refried beans and saturated fat. And he did a nice, he did a nice thing about how it's easy to look down on Esau uh, for this moment. But then he flipped it and, and, and had us, in, had us re reflect on our own choices uh, in, a, in, a, in a really helpful way. Well, I think too, it's uh, one of the, one of the things that we think about when we're, when we're introduced to characters in scripture is, uh, is we, you know, we, we tend to look at them at kind of utilitarian in terms of, okay, what is this, how does this further the story of God or, uh, or, you know, what is this, what is this telling us about God's people? And, but, you know, this is, this is one of these stories and then this whole cycle where it you know it's a it 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 sheds yes it sheds light on the nature of God and who God is and how people interact with God but also so much a mirror for ourselves uh, and maybe it's because I'm the firstborn or something but <laughs> but uh, but just the way in which we have certain constructs that that with which we work that that then assume certain ways that we will be treated in the world or uh, uh, that, that, that we expect certain things to come our way uh, based on those contra constructs. And where is it and how is it, how do we respond when those, con those constructs are called into question or even usurped uh, or then, then how do we then re-navigate our place in the world? And so I think you know, that, that lends into the human condition with regard to uh, with regard to this story, I think could also be really fruitful in preaching. We should go on to Romans. I was going to do that if you'd let me string um, how you began about this larger idea of God, mm. um, of, of the acts of God. Um, the uh, Romans text begins with "In Christ there is no condemnation." So this reality of of the character. Um, of Jacob that is more imperfect like we are than perfect like we would like to be thought of. And um, the promise of God is faithful even in the midst of our unfaithfulness. And when you uh, kind of look at this Romans text in light of that character of Jacob, there's hopefulness for us. Uh, and if you, if you take the idea that I leaned into in terms of the nation, even where the church has failed, and it seems like our failures are so lifted before us right now, and where we have been unfaithful, the power of God can redeem us if we would be able to recognize our own weakness uh, in the flesh and lean into the transforming, uh, merciful um, grace of God. 